Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. One of the great things about RightsCon is, of course, has been that we are able to meet in person, but we have to pretend that we are having a fireside chat now, and unfortunately in a virtual setting. But my hope is that soon we will be living in a universe where physical contact is possible again, because social distancing imposes its, its own restrictions, which are not necessarily terrific, as we all have come to know over the last 16, 17 months. My name is Salil Tripathi. I have two roles. I chair the Writers in Prison Committee for Penn International, which is a global free expression organization for writers and readers, which believes in freedom to write and freedom to read. And I'm also the senior advisor for global issues at the Institute for Human Rights and Business, which tries to ensure that companies live by international standards. So it's a fascinating topic. And I have two astonishingly brilliant uh, colleagues to talk with today, and I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled, as I'm sure all of you are. Uh, let me introduce them one by one. First, Anya Skalamad. Anya uh, has been, of course, most recently the special uh, rapporteur for extrajudicial ex executions at the UN and has done two terrific bits of work. One is, of course, on the case of Khashoggi, which became uh, almost the kind of lightning rod for how special rapporteurs deal with these issues and how they deal with human rights abuses, but also her persistent, stubborn in the positive sense of the term, and steadfast defense of human rights defenders who are facing pressures from recalcitrant government. So we will talk about that as we go along. But she has also launched the Columbia Free Speech Initiative at Columbia University, where I had the privilege of working with her a little bit. And she has a history with Article 19 and with Amnesty International before that. And my other uh, co-participant today is Irene Khan, who has, of course, been the Secretary General of Amnesty International, exactly the job that uh, Anyas has right now. Uh, but we promise we won't be talking about just one organization. We are going to talk about human rights in general. Uh, but Irene is a special reporter at the moment for uh, freedom of expression and opinion, which, of course, is an extremely important uh, right and which is always under siege. And it has both positive and negative uh, outlooks because of what the digital age does. So I'm absolutely de delighted to have both of you here, Irene and Anyas. I suppose we, the, a good way to start, and we'll try to keep this conversational so that it doesn't sound stilted, uh, talking heads and all that. But I think that one of the intriguing things I found with the theme of the conference this year, which is keep it on, on the internet. We all know what happens when internet is shut off. Government switch off uh, networks. Government require companies to do so. We know the case of Vodafone in Egypt, where you know the cell phone system was uh, taken down, and there have been other attempts to either restrict parts of uh, the internet or the entire internet, ostensibly on the ground of security and safety. And yet. When you keep it on, there are other problems. One is, of course, proliferation of lies, what are, what's called fake news, but what we're talking about is old-fashioned lies. And the other is the dissemination of hate speech. So my first question, somewhat provocative from a human rights perspective, is it worth keeping the internet on? Anyas? Oh, sorry. I was going to leave that uh, question to, um, to Irene. Of course, of course, and of course. We need, uh, we need the internet on. Um, it is, uh, and it has proven to be a fantastic, formidable uh, tool and engine for uh, organization, for communication, for um, coming together. We would not have managed to remain an integrated human rights community over COVID without the internet. We would have you know, frankly, uh, disintegrated. Internet has allowed us to, to remain together and to work together. So, uh, of course, we need to keep it on. We need to keep it on, particularly in situations where governments want to keep it down. Um, now, it does not mean that we want to keep it on without any kind of um, uh, framework. And of course, the most important one is human rights framework. We don't want to keep the internet run, being run, being driven, being controlled, either by governments or by multinational, super large, super big 
corporations. We don't want the internet to become simply a site of money making, a site of data collection, or a site for cyber conflict. Um, so, uh, you know, it is, like the rest of the world, a space for conflict. It is not a space that we can just grab and work with, as we probably had intended to do uh, 20, 25 years ago. It is a place and a space around which and for which we human rights activists, human rights organization, human rights defenders would have to fight over. And we are fighting over. That's what I think uh, keep it on means. Keep on the fight. It is a space that we need to fight for, for the soul of which we need to fight for. Irene? Yes, of course. I mean, uh, we wouldn't be talking here today if the internet was not on. Uh, and uh, if anything, COVID-19 has shown how important it is for education, for health, for work, for connectivity with friends and family. It's for me, I see it as a public good. Uh, but of course, uh, like so many uh, other uh, uh, things in life, uh, there is a dark side to it too that needs to be managed. And Anyas has pointed that out. What I would like to underline is keep it on. Yes, but keep it on for everyone. And at the moment, there is a very large part of the world that has no access to Internet. In fact, uh, internet has uh, the use of internet and uh, the way in which uh, its its availability is around the world has created new fault lines of inequality, where 93% of the world's people are close to mobile broadband or internet, but only 53% actually have access to those services, and that I think is an unacceptable situation because so many human rights, application of human rights today, health, education, um, freedom of speech, uh, are both economic and social rights and civil and political rights are dependent on access to internet. So both the accessibility, the affordability, as well as the safety of internet is absolutely essential for human rights activists to take into account and to fight for. I think that's a fantastic point you made because too often when we talk about internet and human rights, the conversation tends to focus on the civil and political rights, you know, right to expression, yeah. right to civil disobedience, right for defenders to come together, right for journalists to exchange information. What is often forgotten is how internet is becoming so ubiquitous in accessing essential services. Now, COVID is a very good example when in country after country we find that the there is this illusion of access by saying that use your smartphone, register yourself, and somebody will send you a note when you can go for vaccination. And there are people who have either no access to smartphone or who have no access to the literacy necessary to be able to use the smartphone. People are elderly, people do not have language ability and all that. And I think that's extremely critical, particularly in the context of the uh, the change campus where students are not in the same class, but speaking in a forum like this. So I'm, I'm very glad, glad you stressed that. And of course, it, um, both of you are human rights experts and, you know, it brings in the whole argument of circle rights and the interdependency of human rights. And to see rights in isolation is not a, a, a very wise thing. Uh, my next question is about really about talking about what has become now that, you know, we used to have these silos that people were human rights defenders, people were journalists, people were state and duty bearers and so on. But Internet is changing those equilibriums in a significant way. What the Internet has done is everyone has become an activist. You know, someone who has a smartphone can portray himself and can build a very credible following as a journalist or as a human rights defender and cast out documenting things. You know, police are wearing these cameras on their bodies in some countries and people are recording police as they are managing demonstrations and so on. So how can the human rights movement itself shift, uh, manage the shift in the responses that are going on? How can it move away from what used to be a very inward looking approach in the past, you know, which was that of seeing things in silos? Because now pretty much anyone can produce evidence. And again, question to both of you, either of you can go first, but Anyas, maybe because you are running the largest membership-based human rights organization in the world, you might want to take tackle that first. I'm not sure I understood your question, Salil. Yeah. Um, what I'm saying is that sorry. 
internet is making everyone an activist or a journalist because you have tools to get it right. Now, hum historical human rights community has been somewhat of an elite state that you know we are the researchers, we are the ones who look at things and we are the ones who pronounce the view. But that equation is now changing because of the access that the technology gives to internet. How are organizations changing to this challenge and responding to the challenge? Okay. Um... You know, I, I don't fully agree with your assumptions. Um, first of all, regarding the, the history of the human rights movement, I, I, I think it was a very mixed uh, mixed bag and there were certainly people, uh, in fact, the human rights movement was uh, largely driven by and dependent upon actors uh, at the local level without uh, necessarily access to uh, some of the means you are describing. Uh, the human rights movement, as you know, the human rights organization like Amnesty International in the past was certainly very dependent on the work done at national level in, in various uh, locations by, uh, by grassroots uh, organization, by uh, trade unionist, uh, indigenous uh, activists, and so on. So, I, um, I, you know, I, I will strongly question that the assumption that uh, human rights was an elitist uh, movement. I, I don't see it that way, at least. Uh, second, in terms of what is happening now, yes, everybody can potentially become um, a transmitter, a vehicle, uh, a communicator of information that is related to human rights protection, uh, human rights solidarity, uh, and so on. That, however, does not make uh, human rights evidence. It is a potential information for uh, human rights purposes. But uh, as you have pointed out in your initial um, question, there is a great deal of uh, noise on internet and through the social media, not, a lot of it is not does not carry any meaning or weight from a human rights standpoint. If I take the example of Amnesty International, but this is applicable to a range of other people and organizations nationally and internationally, you need uh, you we and others have developed very clear expertise so that information that appears in the online world, so that videos, so that audios um, and other forms of information is then assessed very thoroughly to determine whether they have been doctored with, to determine whether uh, they can cross-check with a range of other sources. So information, noise, um, voice, does not necessarily translate into evidence. You know, it's only so there is still a role for a range of actors at all level and um, translating the, the the richness of what's happening in uh, internet, the richness of people being able to communicate and to send videos and information, moving that into an evidence-based um, uh, conclusion and finding uh, is a super important step that uh, a lot of people need to keep doing. Well, thank you. Uh, Irene, yes. Yeah, uh, what I, um, I agree with Anya is that, of course, uh, true human rights struggles have always been fought at the level of communities, local communities, uh, 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 whether it's, uh, you know, in the village or in the region or in the country, uh, that's where human rights change has come historically. But at the same time, I think what the digital age has done is it has created digital communities. So it's not uh, just uh, the villagers, but there is a digital village uh, that has emerged, like the one that we are discussing now, uh, whereas in the past, uh, you would have, for example, amnesty members coming together in amnesty groups. Uh, now, actually, the groups are on the digital stage and you can link up across borders, across um, uh, 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 ideologies in a way in which it was not possible to do in the past. I think in terms of activism, that opens up huge possibilities. 
Uh, and, and we see that happening with Black Lives Matter or hashtag me too, or all kinds of social movements that are coming up there, uh, breaking boundaries, decentralization, empowering individuals to become activists. You don't have to have a card bearing, uh, you don't have to be card bearing member of a particular human rights organization to pick up an issue and, and uh, express your views on it. On the other hand, as Anya says, the expertise of human rights, of course, uh, therefore, becomes more diluted and there is a risk of uh, lower standards of human rights investigation, human rights monitoring taking place. But I think at the end of the day, it is the power of the individual and the faith and belief that we have as individuals in the power of human rights that's going to make the difference. Um, of course, uh, when we have uh, as organizations uh, engage with governments, they need to have a certain standard and quality uh, of their work. But when individuals go out in the street and demonstrate, they don't need uh, that kind of um, expertise. That's much more passion. So I think the digital age has made passion uh, much more available, uh, but at the same time, expertise has come under pressure. So I have a mul multiple layered question here. So I'll try to break it in part now. I mean, all three of us uh, dearly miss a very close friend who we lost last year, David Petrasek, uh, you know, who used to think way ahead of others on, 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 on philosophical issues on human rights. And, and David used to tell, I remember well, that, you know, in, in 20 years ago, he was telling me that this model is going to break. He was prescient in saying that people-based organizations, we were talking about local NGOs, and he was not even thinking about community-based, but he had just come back from Philippines, and he was talking about people-based organizations, which had a completely different perspective. Now, that the passion part is very important, but what I'm, I have a question about, I'm not saying I'm concerned because standards vary, but my question really is about cultural relativism that might come in. So you might have a particular society where the middle class believes certain rights are extremely important, such as right to speak and right to free assembly, right to property, but they may be for the death penalty, or they may be for very strong anti-terror uh, anti laws in their own country. And they are the ones who drive the human rights movement in that country. And there are contradictions. So how is the business model of human rights movement going to change as we go forward? Because clearly the organizations, you, you showed the divide very well, that there's passion on the streets and there's expertise uh, in, on, on the part of the lawyers. Uh, but how do we blend this legal commitment on one side and passion on the other? Well, it's it's not a new challenge, actually. It has happened in the past. I mean, I come uh, from Bangladesh and uh, growing up, uh, I, I lived through the war in Bangladesh in the uh, in 71 and uh, later on uh, violations before the war, after the war, during the war and so on. And what was happening on the ground was very, very real. Um, later, when I came into Europe, there was I didn't find much understanding of that at that time. I'm talking about the 80s and 90s. Uh, at that time, much understanding of the human rights struggle that was taking place there. So over time, of course, uh, even within the UN human rights system, you see with the, uh, with the special rapporteur mandates, for example, my mandate on freedom of uh, uh, expression and opinion or Anyas's mandate, these mandates were early mandates that were created in the 90s. And then now more and more mandates are developing on economic rights, on all kinds of social rights and so on. And so the notion of human rights is not a static one. You know, as lawyers, um, and yes, and I both have the legal background. As lawyers, we like to see everything neatly, nicely written down, but real life is quite messy. And the human rights movement is a messy movement in that sense, uh, where new ideas and thoughts have come in. People's experience have made it uh, very real. Because after all, if human rights has no meaning in people's lives, then it's not going to survive. So yes, there will be tensions in societies, in, in certain societies where there will not be uh, support for the death penalty. In other societies, there will be challenge uh, to uh, sexual orientation issues or sexual identity issues, uh, women's rights. These are all struggles that have taken place. So when we talk about universality of human rights, it's not a, to me, it's a, not a static uh, concept. 
The universality of human rights is challenged every day, is expanded, a consensus is built in one place, consensus is challenged in another place. That's the struggle of the human rights movement. And so I'm not actually worried about this. I'm pleased as long as people actually are debating human rights. Uh, that gives energy to it. I worry very much if human rights was uh, caught in a book and put on a shelf. Right. Um, I want to, uh, you know, Anyas, you hinted a little bit about uh, the way information is being gathered for human rights. And, you know, your tenure as a special reporter, uh, the one pivotal case in another country that I want to talk about both of them with you was, of course, the Jamal Khashoggi incident. And you investigated it persistently. You were courageous. You were steadfast. You were driven by evidence and you took it to a frontier that you don't expect special reporters to do. It was amazing the work you did in that. Now, what are the lessons you learned in that research methodology? And how would an amnesty researcher now approach? Uh, and what would be the what were the strengths you had? Because you were operating with the with the UN uh, with you in a sense, and and what were the weaknesses of that? Because so often you are dependent on member states being you know willing to participate in certain instances, and as well as you know what are what are the what is the autonomy that an amnesty researcher would have as he or she goes about in such a research? Um, thank you, thank you, Salim. Look, in terms of the. Um you know, the, the research into the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, I think the, um, the, the methodology I followed was not uh, the, the typical special rapporteur methodology because I focused on one case and out of one single case being studied in great depth, I uh, sought to extract um, uh, recommendations and findings that go went beyond the case. Most of the time, special rapporteurs begin with um, the principles and work from within the logic of the law or the logic of the principle. When there are individual cases, they are being seen from the standpoint of the principle. I took the case and I questioned the principle. So that was a, a, a different uh, inductive form of um, of, of reflection, which um, I certainly will recommend. I don't think it is applicable to every situation, but in my particular uh, case, by uh, investigating the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, I was able to understand the very broad limitation of the international uh, systems in terms of what it can do for single case, which is very little. Um, I'll stop here to just say that, um, you know, it was a, a form of methodology that, um, uh, you know, differed from the, the traditional approach, um, particularly the human rights approach, which begins with the principle and then apply the law or the principle to a case. I began with the case, I looked at the case, of course, I referred to the principle, but I used the learning from the case to question the legal framework to question public policies and to question um, uh, a, a range of uh, implications. Right. Uh, Irene, uh, your reaction to that? I mean, is that the kind of approach you think is possible in the case of, because, you know, when you're talking about EJEs, you're specifically talking about individual, right to information and opinion does involve individuals, but also there's a broader principle behind that. Well, actually, uh, that was an individual, um, but it, uh, he was a journalist. So in a way, there is a cross uh, over uh, from Anyas's mandate uh, to mine and journalists, as you know, unfortunately, journalism is a dangerous profession today. And many of um, uh, of the killings of this kind happen to be of journalists. Um, I think what Anyas is saying is, is a very interesting approach. Um, she's talking about a very interesting approach, particularly when you want to expose the gaps and uh, weaknesses of the international uh, human rights law system. And it goes back to our earlier discussion about how important the reality is in the human rights world and that we not live with principles and values and create an ideal world, uh, which is great 
for, for debate and analysis and so on, but doesn't make a difference in people's lives. So what Anyas was doing, taking a real case to show that the international system is not equipped to deal with this kind of killing, even though it is a blatant uh, violation, the crudest, most cruelest form of a violation that can take place, but the international system was is not equipped to deal with it. And so what do you need to do with it and how can you strengthen the situation and so on? So, and there are many, many areas where we are actually finding that the principles are fine, but the application is in trouble. And that's why we, and I think the UN human rights system has created a, quite a unique uh, mechanism that governments have actually given power to individuals uh, independent, with full independence, to speak out in the name of the UN. And that is quite remarkable in a membership-based organization to create the special rapporteur system. And what I just want to mention here is that civil society actually is our biggest champion and the need to continue to champion us because obviously uh, we threaten governments, we criticize governments and Anyas herself has done so with some cost uh, to her own uh, safety, security and peace of mind. Um, so civil, we need civil society to keep backing uh, the special rapporteurs and to make sure that we don't get eroded by the politics of the UN. Yeah, but, but there's the other threat that special rapporteurs have always had, which is, you know, the threat from states, which either don't let them in to start with. I mean, there are countries which, you know, hold regular elections. I mean, whether they're democratic is a different question. Uh, who it's, it's impossible for the rapporteur to go to those countries, even for relatively less political rights. I always say relatively because every right has a political element. So I don't want to say that some rights are political and some are not. But even the right to health has political implications. So I certainly don't want to make less of that. But again, I want to start with you, Anyas, and then come back to Irene on the next question, which is a kind of almost vituperative hatred you attracted from some governments, Anyas, because of your exceptionally courageous and strong stance on extrajudicial executions. And I have in mind Philippines here, you know, because every time you said something about Philippines, the president used unparliamentary language in responding to you. They were misogynistic. They were targeting you because you were a woman. And then, of course, there were lots more. And each time I would retweet something you had said, I would also get abused in Tagalog, which I didn't understand, but that, that happened to me. And it happened to me in Turkish as well. So, I mean, uh, when I speak about Mr. Erdogan and his government, so I'm, I'm used to it in a way. But the question, therefore, is that how, I mean, what do we do about cleaning up this space so that it becomes more civil? Is it possible? I mean, you obviously didn't care. And, you know, you, you said exactly what you needed to. Everyone is not able to do that. So how can we, is it possible to make the internet a more, uh, receptive space, or is that just a pipe dream? Uh, you know, I mean, there are different layers to, to your question, Salil. Um, uh, one, uh, one is about the individual uh, themselves and uh, how prepared and willing they are to, um, to stand up. Uh, and that is very much driven by their personal, um, you know, environment, I think, uh, and where they are located. I was, uh, frankly, quite safe. Uh, I, you know, I worked uh, as a special rapporteur. I was mostly based in countries which I think uh, would not have gone out of their way to hurt me or to harm me. And in fact, uh, possibly they would uh, go out of their way to protect me. Um, so compared to individuals currently in Egypt or in Turkey or in the Philippines, through the red tagging in particular, you know, my 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 position was uh, was was really a very privileged one, and in many ways it was easy for me to speak the way I was. So that's uh, the first thing. That being said how much um, support you get when you speak up, I think is extremely important. Who is prepared to stand by your side? Uh, who is prepared to have your back? Um, who is prepared to go out of their way to communicate their support? That 
matters a great deal. It mattered to me, and I'm sure it matters even more for people who are on the front line of uh, harm and, um, and violence. I uh, got a lot of that, not from institution, but from other individuals uh, and from um, you know a, a variety of, of actors. And that gives you the strength and the um, you know the environment that you need in order to keep uh, speaking up and uh, speaking truth to power. So I would like to invite whoever is uh, listening, always stand up for those who are making taking the risk. You know, even if you don't know them, just write to them, use Twitter, use social media, express your um, your support to whoever is courageous, whoever is uh, taking a, a stand, because they will get so much from those marks, um, marks of support. Um, but then you also ask questions about whether the, the Internet can be made more, more civil. And here we're looking more at... Um, regulations and and uh, content moderation it's a very different uh, uh, questions my my one of my um, re realization when i got uh, attacked or criticized or you know you know the object of organized campaign is in fact that the problem may not be one individual statement the problem is rather the way people are organized online to um, you, to work as a mob against uh, individuals. So it is rather the, the use of the digital space for mobbing uh, people, a little bit like, you know, you're suddenly uh, in the street and hundreds of people go after you to lynch you. That to me is one of the dimension of the digital space which does not receive sufficient attention because you're going to focus on the content, maybe on one individual, um, but the capacity of the internet providers or of other actors to control that form of um, activism for the sake of, uh, you know, uh, of misuse of uh, trolls, creation of trolls, to create that impression of collective uh, dimension and a mob going after you. I think we don't have sufficient tools. I remember at the time uh, when I was mobbed by um, thousands of uh, Philippine individuals or just fake accounts, I reached out to Twitter and they pointed out to me that, and they were right, that the initial uh, statement from one um, very well organized person did not violate their community standard, which was fine. However, when then thousands, if not more, I'm mean, talking thousands and thousands of people, then grab that statement and mob you with it, that to me was what Twitter was not prepared to tackle. And when the person that did not break the rule as access to those mobs, to those trolls, to those fake accounts, that I think is what they need to be far more uh, prepared towards. I think they are getting better, by the way, but at the time they could not help me and I spent hours and hours and hours just uh, blocking or muting, you know, thousands, thousands of people. Thank you. No, and I think the point you make, it, it, there is a, an element of uh, complacency that creeps in among others that, you know, this is offline with no online implications. And Irene, I wanted to come to you on that because you so very well know cases of Daphne Karuna Galizia in, uh, in Malta or Gauri Lankesh in India and some about a few years earlier, Anna Politkovskaya in Russian Federation, where uh, these very brave uh, women journalists had received online threats. And, you know, people, ah, it's only online. And then uh, all of them were murdered uh, uh, later on. I'm not trying to suggest that the people who murdered were those who were making the threats, but it created an atmosphere in which it was possible. And it's, it's not a coincidence that all the examples we are citing are of women here. Right? So there is a misogynistic gender-based element to it. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that and how, how do we 
uh, grapple with it. I'm writing a paper as we speak, as I was telling you a few days ago, exactly on the threats to women online. And it, it, it pervades even beyond that with deep fake and humiliation. And I know several human rights defenders and writers who have gone off internet or at least off social media because they don't want that exposure because there are far more important things to do. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. There's a very close connection between the offline and the online. Sometimes in, in the offline, in the real world, uh, a political leader will say something. And we have seen how that is then picked up uh, online, spread, amplified, uh, and, and used then to create more offline violence. So the relationship between online and offline is is very close and complex one. And I actually, in my one of my first meetings with, um, uh, I think it was with Twitter actually, uh, by coincidence, Anyas, where I asked them what lessons they had drawn from the past uh, year, the COVID-19 year, and they said that they had begun to realize how what happens online what kind of impact it has offline. So even for the social media platforms, that was an awakening that these are not two different things. Uh, after all, both online and offline, the manipulation is actually at some point done by a human being or human beings. I think we need to keep that in mind. It's not this technology is just taking, taking over and working automatically. Uh, and that realization, I think uh, it comes to women, but it also uh, uh, certain minority groups uh, and others, vulnerable people at risk, uh, and particularly for women, because you know we go back to the old uh, uh, gender power struggle that happens in real life that is still happening as women becoming more prominent and women are uh, seeking, demanding equality and justice. The same, those same dynamics are transferring, of course, online and uh, making it very hard for women, and especially women in public life online, uh, to carry out their work. But there are clear things that we have learned on how to deal with hate speech. Uh, there has been a lot of work done that, and Anyas was also involved, of course, in the Rabat Plan of Action, in creating guidelines and criteria of how to manage hate speech, because freedom of expression is not an absolute right. Freedom of expression can be restricted, but under certain conditions in international law, uh, lawful, necessary, proportionate, and on legitimate grounds. Uh, it can be prohibited when it's an incitement to violence. Uh, those measures should be used in an appropriate manner. And I emphasize appropriate because very often what happens is uh, the excuse of controlling hate speech becomes a cover for carrying out censorship. So we must be very careful about where we draw lines. And there must be greater realization on the part of companies of the responsibility that they have. They are an intermediary, true, but they are a very powerful intermediary of words and uh, language and message and communications, and they have some responsibility there. Unfortunately, the business model of the companies are not usually, um, don't, don't get enough attention. There is attention given to content moderation, but not to the business model where they have an interest very often in keeping people attracted, in using uh, uh, various mechanisms uh, to, uh, to uh, which actually then lead um, to disinformation, misinformation and hate speech. So there needs to be much stronger realization on their side that their products that they are creating should undergo due diligence, human rights due diligence and human rights impact assessment. And they need to be much more transparent about their rules. And they need to create, uh, for example, uh, uh, the mobbing that you were talking about, Anyas. Uh, it's very easy through, uh, um, even through algorithms and automated means to see in that traffic where, where the traffic is being driven. And then to see why the traffic is being driven there. The traffic might be driven there, for very good reasons, uh, but it can also be driven there for wrong reasons. And they need to look into those issues much more carefully. And they can do that if they were to engage with the people whose rights are being affected. I think it's much more necessary uh, for the digital companies and digital platforms to begin to talk with people whose rights are being affected. Uh, and that's where the multi-stakeholder approach uh, is such a useful one to think about when we talk about the digital world. Because, you know, in the real world, 
you have states and you have companies and then you have civil society making a noise around but when you go to the online world that's when there is need for close partnership between the various entities to figure out how to deal with these dark forces that are moving there yeah you you use the word hate speech and i just wanted to make a very small interjection there and then move on to precisely the theme you spoke about irene which is disinformation i'm just coming to that because you've written a report on it and and hate speech you know the lack of clarity and anyas you also dealt with in during your article 19 days about you know what hate speech means and it has basically come to mean the speech you hate is a hate speech and it extends ends up undermining the whole notion of freedom of expression and i think there is need for greater clarity and anya has also wanted to thank you for pointing out the need to express solidarity with the people who show courage because you know through pen we work with writers who are in prison amnesty of course you know has this prisoner of conscience uh, uh, iconic um, idea that amnesty came up with uh, uh, at its founding uh, and we hear repeatedly from writers who have subsequently been released from prison how important it was for them to receive that support so i can't stress that enough i can't endorse that enough we have them coming and meeting us later at our pen meetings and they say that you know what mattered the most what made us feel that it was worth going on this suffering was worth it was these letters and these messages that came our way uh, emo meo messi the famous writer in africa from cameroon uh, i remember him telling us once that he was uh, the, the his jailer said that you know why are you getting all these letters are you some kind of a vip uh, and he said yes i am a very important prisoner that was his reply at that time so there you go so thank you for making that point but i didn't speaking about disinformation and the uh, and the report you did who should decide what's said and not what's not said on the internet there was a time when we felt that we could trust government because companies were monopolies you know facebook is you know has more members than any country in the more users and and the population of any country in the world and you know they have huge uh, uh, revenue models and so on but then at the same time we have situations of certain countries and i know anyas you just released your report today on xinjiang in in china i think i, I was listening to it on the radio this morning um you have countries i mean situation like myanmar like kashmir like xinjiang and now nigeria taking on twitter where the state is asserting its power and curbing the role of the social media to speak ostensibly on the on this ground of uh, of you know curbing disinformation so how do we navigate that space you learned as you wrote your report and where can we rely on the company and where can we rely on the state in this multi stakeholder model um that's addressed to me yes uh, because yes. i mean yes. it's it, yes. to tell yes. us about your disinformation yes. well you, you know this yeah. well you know um when it comes to freedom of expression both the state and the company have vested interests the state for its political interests and the company for commercial interests and that's why i think it's important um to look at the international law for human rights framework to look at uh, international human rights law which which is very clear who decides the rights holder it's an empowering right and therefore it's not a right that can be easily restricted by either state or or company on the contrary the state has the responsibility to respect uh, human rights but also to protect human rights and that means protect it from abuse or or um, uh, attack uh by non state actors including companies private the private sector um and governments uh need to therefore apply uh, human rights rules to their own policies they and they should not actually use companies to censor a speech in many parts of the world governments are now not censoring themselves but putting restrictions on social media and therefore getting social media to do something that is then not subject to any judicial scrutiny any um uh, means of remedies for for the individuals and that is of course totally wrong companies on the other hand also have to make sure that their own uh, community standards are in line with human rights their products as we were talking earlier the services they provide do not lead to violation of human rights and that they are transparent one of the biggest problems with uh, digital platforms of course is that we don't know what's happening there um and that is is 
without transparency, you cannot have accountability. Uh, and that is where I think governments, the state, should not regulate uh, the content uh, on, on online unless it is in extreme cases, uh, as we talked about incitement to violence uh, and hatred and, and those types of um, uh, extreme cases. But what the state should be doing is regulating social media on transparency, on accountability, on due process. And I think that the way forward really is much more uh, uh, approach of uh, social media councils, for example, where there is a multi-stakeholder approach uh, with users, uh, with um, companies and with governments talking together to see what's the best way of uh, regulating online uh, speech. You know, under international law, false speech, anything that is false is not necessarily uh, prohibited. Uh, what is restricted, what can be restricted or prohibited is the harm that emerges from false or manipulated speech. So the focus should be there, but that focus has to be a very narrow, narrow one, because very often uh, the line between what is misinformation and disinformation and what is actually censorship uh, is a very fine one. And more and more governments are now introducing laws. In fact, 20 states during the COVID-19 period, 20 states introduced legislation on fake news. And very often those laws were so vague um, that, of course, um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, permissible speech was restricted. Uh, companies are being, uh, companies, when we look at how companies are behaving, uh, they have introduced uh, various measures uh, to improve content moderation, in particular in relation to misinformation and disinformation, but they haven't really looked at their own business models that uh, lead to the creation of disinformation. They haven't really uh, made, uh, uh, committed, they commit themselves to transparency, but uh, they haven't really been transparent, especially when it comes to algorithms, uh, when it comes to rec recommender systems and so on. Uh, there is a lack of transparency there. And what we also see is different, the disparity, the disparity in their practice across different geographies. The largest social media platforms are, of course, very acutely sensitive to their largest markets, which happen to be in the Western countries, um, in the global north. And we find very different treatments uh, by these companies uh, in the global south. And the users, of course, are treated very differently. Um, so that's that's a big danger. So I think there's a lot that can be done here to bring a better practice, but we will learn when we work together. And I think the UN system, uh, the governments, um, uh, the major, major governments that are looking in this area, for example, the European Union and the large companies all have a huge responsibility to come across down at the table with civil society, uh, academics and scholars and uh, representatives of users to try to figure out uh, effective multi-stakeholder uh, systems for dialogue and to find solutions. Uh, we have 11, 12 minutes and Anya, so very quickly to you, we have three questions, I want to come to the question. So very quick question to you, can we trust companies to be honest brokers in this? As, as you know, content moderation and so on, because Irene has shown up the challenges do you think, uh, from an amnesty perspective, you think you, you can trust companies? Look, I think um, I, w I would not approach the issue from that standpoint, uh, Sally. First, um, I have, uh, from um, a, a broader global perspective, if not historical, I will say that right now the system is uh, extremely unstable. It's unstable because the technology is evolving. It's unstable because the actors are changing. Um, and to try to create um, a, a regulatory framework upon something that is constantly changing is very difficult, if not impossible. Second, therefore, uh, we need to understand that, in my view, we are in a period of testing out. Government are testing out, companies are testing out, 
users should also be testing out. We are very far from having a solidified, stable system to manage this new space called the digital space, which, as you pointed out earlier, is every everything space, you know? So we are testing out and uh, I like, I want to look at those uh, different approaches from that standpoint. The governments and us need to, to uh, test out. I believe personally that um, in the current uh, environment, international law is a good uh, driver but it is a driver that needs to be challenged so that it can accommodate the existence of actors other than the states. I would like to think that um, corporate actors can self-regulate in an effective way for the purpose of uh, the protection of the global public good, but I don't know whether they will reach that stage without um, being considered as uh, duty bearers under international law, including international human rights law. At the moment, they're not. I think it's a, it's a problem. Um, personally, in all my writing on the regulation of internet, I have increasingly moved towards uh, recommending that we consider the corporate actors in the digital space as uh, legally bound by international law and that if international is not there yet, we need to reform international law. So uh, that's uh, where I'm going. It does not mean that there is no role for government, of course. There are, I think Irene has highlighted some of them, which is really focusing on the working of the commer commercial sector, the antitrust regulations, uh, the control of the market, the control of the, the, the size, uh, and so on and so forth. So I will, you know, I, I do believe that we really need to try out different approaches. I think the um, Facebook Oversight Board is a way for those companies to explore their responsibilities. Unlike many, I think a, a number of people, I am very interested in the kind of jurisprudence that this Oversight Board is going to establish because it is our real first attempt to have a global jurisprudence over global content. Not perfect, but like I said, we're in a period where we need to test out various things. Some will survive, some will not. Great. We have eight minutes. We have three questions. If you can keep your responses brief. The first question is from Chip, and it is, I think, better for Irene. Is there any norm or mechanism in the UN regarding preventing global digital platforms from systematically violating users' digital rights and freedom of expression. Do we have any UN mechanisms? Um, no, for the same reasons, not, not a UN mechanism, but for the same reason that Anya has just explained, that companies are not directly responsible for human rights under international law, so the UN cannot reach out to them. There are voluntary mechanisms uh, that have been developed, for example, the Global Compact. There are other uh, means um, that exist of multi-stakeholder um, or uh, entities that are coming up where companies are also working, but these are all voluntary means. At the end of the day, you hold companies responsible under national law. And I think the states, when, when you look at the monopoly of the companies, where they're located uh, uh, and uh, the kinds of countries where they're located in, then I think some countries have a bigger responsibility here to wake up and do something about it. We see some interesting developments in the context of the European Union. Not all of it is necessarily uh, perfect. Uh, there are some risks there. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, of course, the national regulators play a big role. But I do think that companies have to be brought under greater control. Uh, the UN may not be the best outfit for it. They, they are struggling to maintain uh, some respect for human rights among their own member states, let's not forget. So yeah. I'm not sure that uh, bringing companies within the uh, rubric of the UN will be the best way of dealing with it. But certainly companies need to be regulated. And they are regulated in many sectors. So this is not a new uh, new issue. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that often forgot. There are lots of laws that do apply to companies, and it's not a completely law-free space that's important. And another initiative, of course, is the Global Network Initiative, which is very relevant in this specific uh, 
uh, sector. We are talking about the digital one. Uh, uh, Anya, so I think that the question from Ines, uh, you can wear both your hats and respond, but I think mm -hmm. from the civil society's perspective, mm -hmm. it, it always seems that we have civil society and the UN special rapporteur on one side and the state on the other, yet we see relatively little change and rampant impunity. What other actors can be mobilized to achieve change and the respect for human rights, such as parliaments and businesses? Um, uh, what what Thank ideas? Thank you. Um, so um, first of all, I I you know I'm, I'm I can assure Ines that uh, we have a much more sophisticated approach to um, human rights work, as I'm sure she does actually. So um, in a lot of campaign, lots of global advocacy around human rights situation, we will call on states to intervene. It's not, we don't always work against all states. We may have a position against one state and in order to have some impact on the human rights situation, e.g. in China, we do need to call on other states to do the right thing. We need to call on other states to stand for the UN Charter, to stand for international human rights. So um, it is absolutely not, uh, uh, you know, civil society against states. I think it is a much more diffuse and integrated approach uh, to uh, to human rights um, uh, protection. Uh, with regard to uh, corporate actors, of course they have a role to play. Uh, at the moment, like I said, I find their role a bit too limited. Further. To go back to the previous questions, um, over the last 10 years, our capacity to hold corporate actors for human rights violations has actually decreased. You know, we used to be able to do far more under American tort law uh, and around uh, other uh, laws related to uh, to terror, to um, to uh, torture. That has actually shrunk due to some jurisprudence at the European level. It is impossible to hold corporate actors to account for human rights violations they may have committed abroad or very difficult. The uh, European uh, jurisdictions have not uh, managed, in fact, to develop a system uh, or the legal jurisprudence or the, the legal framework that allows for that uh, to happen. So. Um, there are real limitations at the moment in terms of holding corporate actors for account for human rights violations they commit abroad. We may do that inside our country, but for what they do abroad, it's not there. It does not mean that we do not work with corporate actors. Of course, we have, uh, I'm sure Irene has many relationships, and so do I with uh, digital corporate actors, because they are part of the solution. They may be part of the problem, but they are certainly part of the solution. And we need to work with them. We need to come up with recommendations. We need to understand um, maybe the, 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 the limitation that they are encountering. I think as civil society, we also need to work outside uh, the comfort zone. We need to be prepared to make uh, tangible recommendations not just at a principal level, but really try to be very practical, very policy oriented, uh, while continuing to push the bigger envelopes, such as um, you know, demanding or suggesting that the international legal framework need to be adapted to the 21st century, which means that we need to find a role for non-state actors. Thank you. We have almost just one minute, so we are really on time. So Irene, in only one minute, I'm sorry, it's a profound question and it's very hard <laughs> Is it? But this is from Mark. Will the UN Secretary General's creation of an office of the envoy on technology help you in promoting rights online and positive action by member states and global tech companies? Uh, yes, I think so, because at the, at the political level, uh, it will show support and technology um, is not um, you know, there are specialized agencies in the UN that uh, work on technology, but within the UN secretariat in the main uh, part of the UN, there isn't a place uh, where one can have, uh, you know, conversations about technology, the future of technology. The secretary general, of course, has a roadmap on digital technology. And as I said, technology is not just about social media platforms or even about human rights. It has cut, uh, a cross-cutting impact on everything that the UN does, peace, security, development, human rights, uh, and 
it's very important to make sure that all parts of the UN are going in the right direction uh, to improve people's lives and livelihoods and protect their rights. So yes, it would be helpful to have a, a strong uh, center there. I mean, that's an easy question, I think. Thank you. And that's a very nice positive note to end this very difficult question because it is a grim and uh, and you know not not a very uh, uh, not a topic on which one can be very hopeful about but thank you for both of your excellent work in this regard we await uh, the outcomes with great uh, anticipation and support uh, as amnesty and as a special reporter both of you uh, we have freedom of speech which we have taken for granted but there is always it's important to have freedom after speech and freedom to reach so thank you very much again Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.